Revelation 8. There's a reason why I turned out the way I did, okay? You just mark it down. Freud would have a field day with a guy like me. Uh, Revelation 8. Uh, we're trying to get through the third and the fourth trumpets today. The fifth trumpet has a ton of information in it. Uh, the fifth trumpet, the sixth trumpet, and um, then, of course, the seventh trumpet. Uh, once it sounds, the mystery of God is going to be finished. Uh, as he's declared to his servants the prophets, um, the kingdoms of this world and of um, is become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's the hallelujah chorus. That's where they get it from. Um, I've said this before, I'll say it again. It, in my opinion, the best, very best mixture of Scripture with music was Handel's Messiah. I, there, there's songs that bring me to tears, almost. And uh, I, I love it, uh, because it was written uh, using the verses right out of the King James Bible. And um, it's just absolutely... So glorious that if who of you knows the tradition behind the hallelujah chorus? Hallelujah. Does anybody know the tradition of when that song is played? It is, huh? Yeah, it is, it is by tradition that you stand uh, in honor and reverence of that song and to who it's being sung. And that goes all the way back to. Um, I can't remember what king it was. It may have been a, a King George. But he commissioned uh, Handel to do this. And so on the, the opening night that this is going to be performed for the first time to the public, the king was there. And there are other songs that are played and sung before um, the Hallelujah Chorus. But when they got to the Hallelujah Chorus, the king was so enraptured so elated at the music and at the scriptures and who we are adoring and who we are exalting he stood up the king of england stood up in reverence and in honor of what turns out to be one of the most amazing pieces of musical art that's ever been and that is the hallelujah chorus and so once the king stood up, well, you're not going to sit down. So when everybody saw the king stand up, everybody went to their feet. And it became a tradition that wherever that's performed, if it's, that, if it's the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra and Chorus, when they sing and perform it, everybody stands for the Hallelujah Chorus. Anyway, all right, I'll move on. Revelation 8, the third angel sounded. And there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Uh, I got an email from somebody um, last week and they were asking me, what scriptures do I use to support the idea that stars and angels are the same thing? So on Tuesday's uh, Pastor Mike Online, I dealt with that. And I just kind of went through scripture to scripture to scripture to show you that, um, that Christ uh, or that the angels and the stars are the same thing. And I'm trying to think of a verse here. I'm going I'm to cheat and use my phone here real quick. But I found out something yesterday that absolutely infuriated me. I mean, infuriated me. Turn to Numbers 24. Stars are angels. Angels are stars. Numbers 24, there is uh, a prophecy given. And that prophecy will be fulfilled. So, and let me, just as a general idea, if stars and angels are the same thing, then it helps us 
reconcile in our minds what the, what the wise men were following. They weren't following a meteor. They weren't following uh, some random space event. There was a star that moved in the direction that Christ was and those three wise men from the east, well, we say three, we don't know how many there were, but those wise men came from the east and they were following an angel. An angel, a star, was leading them and it stopped directly over the place where Joseph and Mary and little baby Jesus now are living. And once that angel or that star stopped right there, those wise men said, he's, he's in there. That's where he is. And sure enough, they walk right into it, knock on the door. There he is, the king of the Jews. And they bring their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, uh, something that's going to really... If this doesn't make you mad, you need to work on how mad you get over things. Uh, Numbers 24 and verse... Oh, let's look up here. Um, verse 14, And now, behold, I go unto my people. This is, uh, this is uh, ba Balaam. I go unto my people. Come, therefore, I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, and the man whose eyes are open has said, Verse 16, he had said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. Verse 17, now look at this. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Who is the star out of Jacob? Who is it? You say Christ? Who says Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. By the way, there's no points taken off if you're wrong. Okay. Ask a Catholic priest who that star is. In no uncertain terms, the Catholic Church teaches that Mary is that star. That's blasphemy. And I have the article. It's in my notes. Um... I, I, boy, the devil has been fighting me over recording this, but I got I'm going to try to get to it. But I found that out yesterday, uh, just going through various things about how Catholics view Mary, what the official stance of the Catholic Church is, and so on and so on. And I ran across this article written by a Catholic priest, a Marianist priest. There's a whole sect of Roman Catholics that are called Marianists, and their goal in life is to promote Mary and her um, being co-equal with Christ when it comes to practically everything. Um, in fact, in a, in a subtle way, the Catholic Church is definitely guilty of exalting Mary even over Jesus. Am I, am I out of batteries? Oh, okay. All right. They exalt her in many cases even over Jesus. And in this case here, it is clear to us that this is referring to Jesus Christ, the star out of Jacob. Um, look at the very beginning of the verse of 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. It's a him, not a her. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel and destroy all the, uh, smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. And uh, the more I read about how the Roman Catholic system exalts Mary even above Christ or God Himself, it angers me. It does. There is a, a Catholic church up in Chicago 
uh, St. Stanislaus Catholic Church. Uh, it's a Polish Catholic Church. And they have uh, where, they, where the priest will store the Eucharist from one mass to the other uh, is called a tabernacle. In this case, in this particular church, there is a, a, uh, a rendition of or a duplicate of the Ark of the Covenant. And lo and behold, sitting on top of the Ark of the Covenant is the Virgin Mary with their arms out like this. That Ark of the Covenant is God's throne, where God said He sits between the cherub, the cherubs. The two cherub wings went out and in, uh, covered the Ark with their wings. And that was, there's only one person authorized to sit on that throne, and that is God, amen. But I looked at that one time, and I'm going, I can't believe I'm seeing this. Surely somebody has got to have some kind of knowledge of the Bible to know that Mary has no place sitting in the seat of God. Somebody say amen. In that sense, she now has become Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And making Mary an equal partner in man's salvation makes her Lucifer being like the most high. Uh, it, it ought to anger us. It ought to, as, as uh, Jude put it, we ought to contend for the faith that has been given to us. Somebody say amen. All right, now, uh, we're focused on this particular star. The star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. Many men died of the waters because they were made Bitter. The waters were very, very bitter. Mankind couldn't drink it. And so many men died. The Bible doesn't give us an exact amount or even a percentage in, as it does in other situations. So we just know that many men died because they were not able to drink the water. We were looking at this thing of wormwood and bitterness and how it was seen in the scriptures. Deuteronomy 29 is the place where we looked uh, last Sunday. Uh, turn to Proverbs chapter 5. This is a good one here. Proverbs chapter 5. In all your readings of the Bible, did you ever come across a place in the Gospels, a place in the letters of the Apostles, a prophecy from the Old Testament prophets, in one of the Psalms and anything like that, that God would ever exalt the woman who turned out to be the mother of Jesus Christ. Is there anything in the scriptures that tells you that God was going to do that? Not, not a word. Not one word. Um, to say that the Catholic Church is a church that pretty much serves Mary over anybody else is an understatement. Mary is their God or goddess in that sense. In that sense, then, they have taken the character of Mary from the Bible and shaped her in a different way and given a different meaning and a different understanding to her than what the Bible gives to us. Was there anything said by Christ on the cross that leads us to believe that Mary was also suffering the way Christ suffered on the cross? Therefore, she is authorized to be part of our salvation and that there is no salvation without including Mary in that. Was there anything that Jesus said or did from the cross that would lead us to believe that? Nothing. Nothing. The only thing that Jesus said was to John, Behold thy mother, woman, to Mary. He called her woman, not mom, not mother. Woman, behold thy son. In other words, John was going to take custody over Mary and take care of her the rest of her life. 
Uh, Catholics teach that Mary went to sleep, but instantly she was taken body, soul, and spirit immediately into heaven. And so you won't find Mary's bones, Mary's grave anywhere. It's because she was instantly transported into heaven. Okay? That, that's not even what happened to Christ. Christ died and was dead for three days and preached the spirits in prison. Whew, oh, I get upset. So, you what? That's right. Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. Uh, in that sense, she was being, she was showing the characteristics of a godly woman. She never one time promoted herself to anybody, nor exalted herself over anybody else, nor did she allow or demand anyone else to promote her and exalt her. So, here she is. She just gives birth to the Christ child. She knows who this child is and what he's going to do. But Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. She did not go around telling everybody, I am the mother of God. Does God have a mother? According to the Catholic Church, they do. God has a mother and her name was Mary. She is the mother of God. Mater Dei is how they say it. So in this sense now, the, um, the, the sobriety of Mary, the quiet spirit that she maintained throughout her life was evidence that God had blessed her and God knew that she wouldn't go run around to everybody she met saying, I am the mother of God, I am the mother of God, I am the mother of God. But I can tell you that in practically every place in the world where Mary has made this supposed appearance, she's always telling the people on the earth, I demand that you build me a, a, a church in this spot so that people can come and uh, adore me and pray to me and I will carry those prayers to my son Jesus and he will forgive your sins through me. That's what she says. Proverbs 5, verse 1. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. So, in Proverbs, the first five, six, seven chapters, maybe eight, uh, deal with Solomon taking his son and trying to instill the knowledge and the wisdom that God had given to Solomon. And Solomon writes things like this. My son, if you'll listen to your daddy, listen to my wisdom. If you'll, as I'm telling you how my life turned out and the things that I did wrong in life, as I tell you these things, don't make that same mistake. And grab a hold of that understanding and keep that knowledge. And that knowledge then will preserve you. And that knowledge then, verse 3, for the lips of a strange woman. So, in Proverbs, you have two women. You have, the, uh, you have wisdom, characterized as a woman. She is, uh, I think, a representation of the church, full of the Holy Ghost. And then you have another woman who is the strange woman. You have the virtuous woman who is without spot or wrinkle, who is like unto a virtuous woman. But then also you have the strange woman. You have the harlot woman. And that's who this strange woman is. Any reference to strange woman in the book of Proverbs is a direct represent, is or points you directly to mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So Solomon is desperately, I mean, what was, what of Solomon's weaknesses? The Bible says it. Solomon loved many strange women. So if there was ever anybody experienced on strange women, it was Solomon. Because he married 700 of them 
and had 300 concubines of them. Okay? And he, there, yeah. So he's authorized to tell us. See all these women? Avoid them like the plague. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. So let's say there's a church that you could go to that whereas you've been feeling guilty about things that were going on in your life, you go to this church, you find out that that pastor is sweet-talking you and telling you that you're not really all that bad, that God made you the way you are, and that, you know, it's, it, it's not as bad as it really seems. God, God still loves you. God will accept you just the way you are, so on and so on and so on. The harlot who receives money for returning love favors to a man doesn't necessarily care whether the guy is good looking or not. It's just that, does he have the money? That's the sole reason why she does what she does. It's about the money. What is the root of all evil? The love of money. So her mouth is smoother than oil. But, verse 4, her end is bitter as wormwood. So, you may start out in this direction with a strange woman luring you away. And she may make all these promises. She may tell you she loves you. She may tell you that, oh, I'll never treat you wrong. I'll never do you wrong. This and that and the other. But years later down the road, you find out that that was probably the worst, stupidest mistake you ever made in your life. Her end is bitter as wormwood. So take that then to this third trumpet sounding and God sending that very star to the earth, a spirit that turns the waters into wormwood and bitterness so that many men die. Many people die. Her end is bitter as wormwood. And then he says, sharp as a two-edged sword. I saw that once and I had to go back and look at the verse again where it says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We, and, and I don't want to get too deep into this, but the Bible that we have is not sharp as a two-edged sword. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. The only way to undo the damage that the strange woman and her tongue has caused is to pull out something that is stronger and sharper than what she's got. I mean, that was, that was Reagan's whole foreign policy, especially with the Soviet Union. If the Soviet Union is going to build a thousand nuclear missiles, we're going to build five thousand nuclear missiles. And everything they do, we're going to spend triple on that to make sure that we always have the edge over them. We dare not let them gain an advantage over us. And he was right. He got to see the fall of the Soviet Empire. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Notice that her feet go down to death. And her steps take hold on hell. Let me apply it this way. There are churches that save. There are churches that will condemn. There are doctrines that you learn from the Word of God that will bless your life. It will teach you God's righteousness. It will help you live in a way that you've never lived before. It will instruct you in the ways of God and the more you read it, the more you understand who God is and how God is and what God expects and what God, what, how God says things and how God does things. And so that if somebody came in this church or any church you were a part of with a false spirit and they brought that spirit into that church, 
you could be one of the people that said, that is not the Holy Spirit of God. And I'd send you to Asbury College in Kentucky to tell those people, that's not revival. It's not revival. No, no, no. It's a different spirit. And her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. In other words, if you follow her and follow her doctrines, follow her teaching, you're doomed. You are doomed. Paul talked about damnable heresies. Okay? Speaking lies and so on. Uh, verse 6. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Uh, just to bring this up very quickly. Uh, I've taught you all a little bit of this. Uh, I've done several videos on it. But in the Bible translation world, there are two different Greek texts that determine what the New Testament will say. The one text, which is where the King James come from, is called the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. And it agrees with what's known as the majority, uh, the manuscript majority. What is it called? The majority text. That's what it is. Over 5,000 whole or partial copies of the New Testament written in Greek that agree in almost every single way. And there really is no dispute about what the New Testament then, that would be translated in English, there's no doubt about what it, what it should say. But then you have the critical text. And by that I mean you have these scholars all over the world who are still not satisfied with the Greek text that is out there in the seminaries, the Bible colleges, in the church libraries, and so on, because that text is an ever-changing text. The uh, Nessel Aland Greek text, which is what I was told to get when I was taking Greek, my second year of Bible college, get the Nessel Aland Greek text, because that's what we're going to use. The edition that we were using back in 1986 is not the same edition that is being used now and we are just months, maybe a year or two away from a new uh, uh, rendition of this Greek text that will have multiple changes in it from the previous Greek text. So George, every time they come out with a new Greek New Testament, it would be then of necessity that the various Bible pub publishing companies would have to go then and translate that new Greek text in order to have those changes put inside their Bible. So in other words, whether you have it, if you have an NIV from 1980, the NIV that you have now does not match the NIV that's out on the market right now. The NIV that's out there now is the gender neutral Bible. And they don't agree with each other. Same thing with the New American Standard. The Holman Christian Standard and so on. They're constantly having to change the words of the Bible because the Greek text in their mind is constantly changing. And that is a great example of her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Let me throw something else at you too. Suppose... Um, Suppose me and David were out there playing basketball. And I made up a rule that said anytime David makes a shot toward the basket, I can go and move the goalpost. Is that a good rule? 
For me it is. Of course it is. Yeah, that's the way I played, Mom. Thanks for bringing that up. Just because I was tall doesn't mean I was gifted. Quit! Yeah. So if I keep moving the goalpost, is there any chance David's going to win? Not a chance. Huh? No. It's not going to win. So it's exactly that way. The Bible translation, think about the Catholic Church now. They say they believe the Bible, but the truth is they don't. They believe parts of the Bible, but they believe in church tradition and the encyclicals of the various popes. Though, and what that pope says has authority even over what the Bible says. That's how they can look at that verse we looked at a while ago and say that the star of Jacob is not Jesus, it's Mary. That's how they can take the second commandment completely out of the catechism, which they say is what saves you, take the completely out of the catechism so that as you're reading the catechism, the commandment that you should not bow down to any graven images or make any graven images is gone. And the rule is that if Pope Francis felt that he was being moved by God in some way to come out with some new church dogma, if he said it, that's what's in place. And it doesn't matter what any of the other popes said before him. It doesn't matter what Peter said or John said or Jesus said or Moses said. He can override them anytime they want. So what they're doing is that they're constantly changing the goalposts. While the Catholic Church recognizes that Peter was married, he's still the first pope. So where did they come up with the idea that the clerics or the priests or the popes cannot be married? They added that years later. Where did it come up that Mary is co-equal with Christ? They came up with that years later. They added to it. So her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. You want to know what God says? Then you better keep going to the Catholic Church or any other church, mind you, that alters the Word of God. Because they're always going to be moving it, changing it, altering it to fit the whims of, of the society that we have right now. And that's the spirit of Jezebel, that's the spirit of Babylon, that is the strange woman whose words are bitter words, they taste like wormwood, and she is the reason why this star now has fallen to the earth. That is to punish mankind for following after the lips of the strange woman. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word this morning. And Lord... Bless the message to be preached this morning. Father, humble me behind that sacred desk. Help me to deliver, Lord, the message you've given to me. Help me to do it in love. In a spirit of grace, Father. Lord, I really want to see people in heaven. That's what I want. I want to see all these people, no matter what challenges they have, I want to see them in heaven one of these days. Father, would you bless the word this morning, we ask, and we pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen.